I want to welcome you this morning. We're glad you're here at Harvester. And I see some people wearing green. Uh, it's St. Patrick's Day. Now, the question is this. How many of you did it on purpose? How many of you wore green on purpose? Okay, some of you. Excellent. The rest of you are like, oh, this looks good today. And it just happened that it's St. Patrick's Day. We want to welcome you regardless. Um, and we're glad that you are here. Uh, we are in a series called Desperate. Uh, rejected. And the sermon today is, is called Desperate. And let's talk a little bit about desperation because when you hear this word, you may be thinking something different than what we're talking about, okay? Uh, when we talk about desperation today, it's not the kind of desperation that you feel whenever you are binge watching a show on Netflix and the season finale happens and you're like, I can't wait until the next show, you know, comes on. Like, I'm desperate. That's not the kind of desperation that we're talking about here. Neither are we talking about the kind of desperation, how many, you know, that you felt whenever you go on a road trip and you decide to drink a 44 ounce, you know, just soda, just Mountain Dew, you know, and then you don't realize that your bladder only holds about 16 to 18, inch, you know, ounces of, of liquid. And so you go down the road and you realize that the next exit that has a gas station is 15 miles away and you feel desperate, right? At that moment you say, oh my goodness, I'm desperate to find an, a gas station. That's not either the kind of desperation that we're talking about here. What we're going to be talking about is a kind of desperation that makes you feel on the outside, that makes you feel isolated and lonely, and in this case, many times rejected by God. That makes you ask questions about life and about God that, you know, sometimes we don't get to ask unless we're in these kind of situations. December 21st of 2014, 2014, uh, it was a Sunday, and my family, our family didn't realize that this day was going to change what 2015 looked like for our family. Uh, we were getting ready to come to church, and uh, Julie just happened to yawn, and when she yawned, her jaw just basically dislocated. It popped out of place, and then she couldn't really uh, just closed it, but then she couldn't really open it. And so for those of you who, you probably don't know this unless you have had an experience like this, but if you were to measure how wide you can open your mouth, it's going to be about three fingers. You put three fingers between three and four fingers. And I see some of you doing that exactly. Uh, let me see if it's, he's lying or not. Um, for some of you, maybe able to fit your fist. Don't try it. I don't want to have anyone with a dislocated jaw here. You may well, if you have a big mouth, right, you're like, Gus, you can do it. I probably could. Uh, put your fist in your mouth, but for the most part, it's between three and four fingers. Now, to give you an idea of what Julie's condition was after this happened, she could not fit one single finger, you know, uh, just that's how wide it was. Just barely could, oh, she could barely open it. Now, here's what it meant. One, she was in pain. And uh, two, she couldn't eat very well or talk very well. And uh, this had happened before. So what we thought is like, hey, usually what she would do is she would have to take some anti-inflammatory medicine and then take a nap. And during the nap, at some point, her muscles would relax and it would just pop back in place, basically. So we were like, okay, we're going to go to church. And then you're going to come home. You're going to nap. And then it'll all be Okay. So we did that, came to church, went back home, she napped, wakes up, still out of place. Like, okay, man, bummer, maybe overnight. And we go, you know, we spent, she, she slept, you know, all night and woke up, still out of place. Now, we're starting to get a little worried, okay? So Monday, and then I think Tuesday, finally, okay, we need to call the doctor and do something about this. And so she calls the doctor, I think, I don't remember, she, she may have gotten more medicine, and he's thinking, you know, at some point, it's going to just get better. Nothing is happening. Now it's been, you know, maybe about a week or so. And someone tells us about a chiropractor, that maybe sometimes chiropractors can literally manipulate the jaw back in place. And so we're like, well, sure, let's, let's give it a try. So we go to a chiropractor, and, you know, I remember this is one of the, like, most difficult sit situations to watch, to see. You know, the chiropractor just really trying to handle, manipulate her jaw back in place, and nothing is happening. She's crying, literally tears flowing from her mouth and from her eyes, and just really, uh, yeah, not from her mouth. That was, that's lover. 
as usually. We call it tears. No, there was no slobber going on there. Just tears, you know, flowing. And we had the kids with us. So I'm like trying to distract the kids and listening to, to my wife just in so much pain. It was terrible. Um, so that didn't work. And then the, the doctor said, let's try physical therapy. Now we're weeks into, into this, okay? She is in a lot of pain, unable to eat very well, unable to, to talk very well. And uh, at some point, I remember she just quit complaining. At some point, she just didn't say anything about it anymore. It was just life, but not a very good one for her, for sure. Then, after physical therapy failed, there was talk about surgery. And the earliest you could get us you know, in was May. And so we're like, at this point, this is the kind of desperation that I'm talking about. When you're like, okay, whatever needs to happen, we're, we're in, we're listening, we're open. So surgery happens in May, and he says, hey, you're going to feel stiff a little bit, but then your mouth should be able to open, you know, normally. So she feels stiff for a few days, and then that turns into a couple of weeks, and he's like, man, I still feel like I can't open my mouth. And then we were traveling to see family, you know, to go to Mexico, and we went to Mexico, and we're like, hopefully while we're there, you're going to be able to feel better. Nothing happens, still a lot of pain, sharp pains. Come back, turns out the surgery didn't work. Now, it's been over six months at this point, and he says, we're going to have to wait at least a few months before we can even operate, because we need to let that rest. Now, when you hear those words, there's going to be months, and it's been months already, that really gets you to desperate moments. And I remember we thought, hey, let's bring the heavy hitters out, right? So we go to the elders of our church. Like the Bible says in James 5, go to the elders and let them, you know, anoint you with oil and pray for you. And, and we just do follow the biblical command and, and we ask him to pray for her. And it was really, at this point, we had our small group praying and they had been praying all along. And some of you, you were here. I, I, I want to say, you know, we felt like you were praying for us and we want to thank you, those of you who did. And we go to our elders and they, I remember we went to St. Charles campus and they prayed for her. And that we're still, you know, we're hopeful and we were moved but still nothing, and finally the surgeon says, we're going to have to do a second surgery and remove the cartilage, and there is the, the risk that eventually it may turn into, into arthritis, but at this point, you're like, we don't care, we just want her to feel better, and finally, December 29th of 2015, over a year later, she had this surgery, and finally, she was able to go back somewhat to normal. Now, uh, if you ever get close to Julie and she yawns, you're going to hear a big old pop. That happens every time she opens her mouth, you know, a certain width. And that's going to be for, there for the rest of her life. But uh, at least there's no pain at this moment. Now that, I remember throughout that year, asking many times, Lord, why? You know, what is the purpose of this? What's happening? Why, you know, why do we have to go through this? And I know that there is people in this room that maybe right now you're asking yourself the same question. God, what is happening? At times we were driven to God. At times we were driven away from God. At times we were mad at God. At times we saw his grace and felt it. Desperate moments bring you to, to, places in your, to a place in your life in which you really don't understand what's happening. And if that's you today... This passage is going to be for you. But if you haven't been through desperate moments, let me just tell you, you're going to face them in life. And so I want you to pay attention to this story of two people that were completely different, yet found themselves in desperate moments together around Jesus. And so open your Bibles there in Luke chapter 8, verses 40 through 56. It's a little bit of a long passage. If you, but, but, but I want you to hang in there with me and just... Look at these two. One is a man. It's a religious leader. The other one is a woman, probably a Gentile woman. But both of them find themselves in a desperate situation. And so just pay attention to their stories, okay? Luke 8, verses 40 through 56 says this. Now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, and they were all, uh, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. Jesus was on his way 
The crowds almost crushed, as Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed them. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind them and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touch me. I know the power has gone out of me. Then the woman, seeing that she could, no long, she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then Jesus said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe and she will be healed. Then he arrived at the house of Jairus and did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She's not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, My child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. Um, there are a few lessons that we can learn from this passage where Jesus sees a man and a woman in completely different situations in desperation. And here are some of the lessons that we can learn. There are three lessons, not, not exclusively, but these are three that I drew from this passage. If you have your outlines, you can write them there. Number one, the first lesson that we can learn is that neither religion or wealth can save you from desperate moments. Neither religion or wealth can save you from desperate moments. I'm going to tell you my side of Julie's story, okay, as a pastor. Uh, we had just uh, been asked to, to be the camp, you know, I had just been asked to become the campus pastor that fall. And we were excited, we were at the same time terrified because, you know, there's, there's responsibility in, in leading the campus, and, but we felt blessed and we felt like, you know, we had a good group of people around us, a group core, and just a good congregation, and, and we were excited. And when this happened, I tell you what, uh, it really showed that sometimes we use religion. It showed in my life, let me speak for myself, spoke, it showed in my life that I sometimes use religion as a shield from bad things in this world. That you sometimes want to come to church and you, it's like a transaction, it's like, God, I do my part. And you do your part. I come to church on Sunday. You protect me from anything bad that's out there. And that's why I feel because, and I'll tell you how I noticed that. Because I feel like it was unjust that this was happening to us. And that really shows your heart. If you ever, if something ever happens to you and you feel like you don't deserve it or like God is not, you know, coming through with this part of, of the, the plan of the transaction. That means that you see religion as a shield from the bad things that, that could happen to you. In this case, Jairus was a synagogue leader. Luke tells us that twice. And I tell you what, these people were people that sometimes we portray uh, the Pharisees and the synagogue leaders as bad people, but they were just religious people. And, and you know, he facilitated prayer. Jairus probably prayed every day facing Jerusalem. He would read the scrolls of the Torah and, and, and the prophets to the people. He would help translate this into Aramaic, which was the common language, so that people could understand it. He would write paraphrases so that it would be a little bit easier for the people to read and understand. He would give sermons and benedictions and blessings to the people. I mean, this is a guy that was dedicated to, 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 you know, to his religion, yet he found himself in a tough spot. He found himself in a desperate situation and I'm going to tell you if you look to God and to religion only to be protected you're going to be disappointed I want you to know that you are going to be disappointed because religion is not simply a shield for you number two we need to understand something especially in our culture that wealth is deceptive it gives us the, the illusion that it can protect us from almost anything 
but it's so deceptive and you need to be careful. Wealth cannot protect you or save you from pain in this life. Wealth cannot protect you or save you from desperate situations. It's just an illusion. Uh, there is a story of a businessman that had an angel appear to him. Right, this is not a real story, but it just gives a, it makes a point for you and me. And the man requested uh, just a favor from the angel, and the angel says, fine, I'll grant you one request. So this businessman says, all I want is a copy of the paper a year from today in the future that includes all of the stock market, you know, just quotes and exchanges. And so the angel grants him that request, and the man is so excited. He's reading through the stock market, and he's like, man, I know really what investments I'm going to be able to make this year, and it's going to bring me so much money. As he's glancing through the paper, he happens to see his picture on the obituary column, you know, next year. And that changed everything for him, right? It's like when you see your picture, and when you know that death is coming or pain is coming, all of a sudden money isn't as important, is it? Wealth has a deceptive capability to tell us that it can protect us. And we live in a country, in the wealthiest country probably in the history of the world. And so we think we have the best technology, we have the best doctors, you know, and that can protect us. And I'm going to tell you, if you believe that, then you will find yourself surprised by desperate situations. Neither religion nor wealth can save you from desperate moments. Number two, desperation comes... Through sudden, unexpected circumstances or drawn out suffering. There's two ways most, that most people find themselves in desperate situations. One is through sudden, unexpected circumstances or through drawn out suffering. And both circumstances are you know, portrayed in this, uh, in this story of Jesus. So Jairus comes and the Bible says that he falls at the feet of Jesus. Because his daughter was dying. Now, if you're a parent, I think that you can totally understand what was going on in Jairus' mind. How many of us have seen our kids sick or in pain? I remember Isaac was dehydrated and he's the, the littlest one of all as far as he's just the skinniest of all of our kids. And he's got real tiny arms and then he's dehydrated and probably his veins were even smaller and... You know, the, the nurse tried, you know, came in. We had to take him to the emergency room on one occasion. And they come in and they stick him and they couldn't find the veins. And do you know what, a, I mean, if you're a parent, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You feel this sense of like, one, desperation, but also anger almost. And you're like, what's going on? Like, what's happening? You know, like, you get paid to do this and you can't find my kid's vein and you're making him suffer. It's like this just protective instinct that comes in. Now imagine Jairus not knowing what to do, seeing his daughter's life slowly fade away. And the Bible says that he comes and he falls at the feet of Jesus. Now, here in our culture, no one has probably ever done that. I, I doubt that any of us have ever fallen at someone's feet, right? Probably the last time that you did that was when you were two and your mom or your dad took the certain toy away and you just fell on the floor at their feet and you're like, give it back to me. But other than that, you probably haven't fallen at anyone's feet. It's weird, right? But in this culture, actually, it was weird as well. And that tells you the kind of desperation this man is going through. So he, because Greeks and Jewish people didn't fall at anyone's feet because it could be construed as worship, so they wouldn't do it. But this man is so desperate that he sees this teacher that has been healing people, and he's like, I have, you have to help me, Jesus. My daughter is dying. And he falls at his feet and asks and begs for help. The one thing that we can learn from this man is that I hope that when you find yourself in desperate situations, you are driven to the Lord. I do encourage you, just like Jairus, you be driven to the Lord, you seek Him, and you go straight to Him. So sometimes unexpected circumstances do that. And I tell you what, if we are honest, you may feel like you're not uh, close to any moments of desperation, but we are one decision away, one mistake away, one accident away, one heart attack away from tragedy and finding yourself just like this man found himself. So make sure that you pay attention as you read this scripture. Here's number two. The second reason why people find themselves in, in desperate circumstances is this. Just drawn out suffering. 
If you read there, it says that there was a woman that had been subject to bleeding. More, uh, more than likely, it was some type of vaginal bleeding for 12 years. 12 years. And there's, th this story is in different Gospels. And one of the Gospels says that she had spent all she had on doctors, but no one could help her. And here's what uh, that drives you. 12 years will drive you of this situation, of this circumstance, of this pain or suffering will drive you to be desperate. Michael Easley, he was the president of Moody Bible Institute. Uh, he's no, no longer the president, but in 2001, he says that he woke up and he had just slight hip pain. He thought, oh, that's no big deal. So he went on you know, with his day and he took some anti-inflammatory medicine and he went back to bed that night and he woke up and now it wasn't only his hip but his lower back and it seemed like it was just you know within weeks he said his entire back was in so much pain he just couldn't stand it so you know just in a few weeks he was diagnosed with a really rare disease that was just literally eating up the or the cartilage in his spine and so they ended up having to take all of the disc in his spine and they fused his spine together. And otherwise he was going to just literally, he could potentially die if, that, if they let that continue. Uh, so he ended up, after just a few months, after waking up with this pain in his hip, he ends up with his back just fused completely, unable to move like you and I enjoy moving. And, and just he talks about just the time after the surgery, all the pain that he went through, all the pain medications. He was con in control, medic you know, controlled um, uh, medications, but he said it was so much of it that he couldn't even drive. He had to be driven places. He couldn't sleep at night. He got to the point where he remembers talking to his wife and saying, I literally want to jump off a cliff. He's like, it wasn't that I was suicidal. I was simply tired of this situation, tired of the pain, tired of me being unable to do the things that I was once used to do. And when he got to that point, luckily he had a good godly wife that, that said this to him. He recalls that she just looked back at him and said, Michael, we need to look back at our lives. God has always been faithful throughout our lives. Why wouldn't we trust him with our lives today? When you are exposed to drawn out suffering, you will experience a breaking point. And this woman was at a breaking point. She'd been uh, just with this kind of bleeding and, and suffering for 12 years. And even though she wasn't supposed to be around people because that was just uh, uh, prohibited by the religious laws, she doesn't care that she goes into a crowd just to touch Jesus. Now, here's what the, the Bible says. Here in your translation, you hear that it says that she touched just uh, the edge of Jesus' cloak. And here's what it means. It was actually tassels. The word is like tassel. And this is what a rabbi like Jesus would wear on his head or his shoulders. It's, a, it's called a prayer shawl. And uh, th these would be hanging. And so if Jesus had it, you know, over him, probably over his head or over his shoulder, he, she literally, the Bible says that she got close enough just to touch the tassels of his cloak, of his prayer shawl. Now, when this happened, the Bible says that she was instantly healed. And that's going to lead us to our third point. So sometimes either sudden circumstances or drawn out suffering get, you know, gets, gets us to desperate moments. But the last lesson that we can learn here is that Jesus gives hope to the living and the dead. Let's see what happens with these people that, that found Jesus in this circumstance. It's interesting to me in verse 45, when this woman does that and touches Jesus, you know, just tassels of his prayer, his prayer shawl, she, uh, he says, who touched me? Now, you know, we see that and we read before that that Jesus was surrounded by people that the Bible says, Luke says and records, he was almost crushed by the crowd. There was so many people around him that he's almost crushed. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to a big, big city, but I grew up in Mexico City and I can tell you during some festivals or, you know, some events, you go to the streets of downtown and literally 
you come out of there and you're like, I think that every part of my body has been touched today. Okay, there's no bubble. If you think that going to Walmart on Black Friday is bad, no. Like, you're just going to be touched completely. Or try getting onto the, the Metro Link, you know, and just riding in the subway at 7 a.m. during rush hour in Mexico City. Every part of you is going to be touched, some, you know, in some way or form. So this is Jesus, and I think it's a little bit of a sense of humor. He's like, who touched me? But here's why I believe. I always wonder, why did he say that? The reason why I believe he said that is because he wanted the woman not only to experience his power, but he wanted the woman to experience his heart, his character. And God, I believe, wants the same for us. He wants to give you hope, but not only through his power, which see, if you, you and I, when we find ourselves in desperate situations, all we care about is God's power. Is God, can you do this for me? God, will you? I know that you have the power. We just want to experience his power. But I want, you, I want to remind you, as you find yourselves in desperate situations, Jesus wants to show you his heart. That's why he asked the question, because then that question points the woman out. Verse 47 says that she couldn't you know, be unnoticed anymore, so she falls at his feet trembling in fear. And it's like, this is why I did it, Jesus. I was so desperate. I just needed to be healed. And Jesus shows her his heart and says, daughter, your faith has healed you go in peace and then we see that as this is happening servants you know from the house of Jairus come and and say hey your daughter just passed away don't bother the teacher anymore now we also see that Jesus could have healed from far away we see in the gospels that Jesus doesn't have to be right there by the person or touch him for them in order to be healed but Jesus didn't do that because I believe that he wanted to show his heart to Jairus as well Jesus could have might as well said at the beginning of this passage, said, Jairus, don't worry, go home. Your daughter is going to be healed. It's going to be okay. But Jesus didn't because he wanted Jairus to see his heart and to, to grow in his faith. And when Jairus is given those news of the death of his daughter, Jesus responds in verse 50, don't be afraid. Just believe. Don't be afraid. Just believe. And Jesus later goes on and touches this dead body of this little girl. And she tells him, my child, get up. And the girl gets up. And I want you to know that Jesus wants you to know his heart. Not only that he wants to give you hope, not only through his power, but through his heart. To let you know that he cares for you, that he cares about you. Now as we finish this message, we have to, to make a little... A little stop. I have to make a note because I know that there are people that may be desperate right here in this room. You may be tired of, you know, uh, just some type of sickness or disease or a situation in your life, in your relationships. Maybe it's just simply you're, you've been struggling with something. Uh, maybe it may be depression. It may be anxiety. It may be whatever it is. I know that there may be desperate people in this room. And here's the question that, maybe two questions that you may be wondering. Number one, can God still help me? I see it in the Bible. Can God still help me? And I'm going to tell you, just because of what I see in Scripture, I can tell you, yes, God can still heal you and help you. The Bible says that Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. He still has the power to do whatever needs to be done. Which leads us to the second question. Will God choose to heal you? Will God choose to heal me or help me? The answer is, I don't know. That I don't know. There is uh, a message out there that says that the reason why people aren't getting healed today is because they lack faith or because they may have some secret sin in their lives. And I'm going to tell you, I don't see that in Scripture at all. Uh, Joni Erickson Tada is a lady that has struggled living in a wheelchair, unable to move her legs or hands due to a diving accident that she had. She broke literally her spinal cord and she lost, you know, just the ability to walk and the ability to move her hands. And this happened when she was 19, I believe, and she struggled with this for her entire life. And uh, she, she recalls of a time where she was just desperate, wanting healing. And she went to this healing crusade. 
you know, people saying, we're going we're gonna to heal you today. And she recalls being pulled into the very front of the room with an, about another 20 chairs. And this was a packed room. And she says that worship was amazing and the speakers were good. And finally, they start praying for healing. And all of a sudden, the spotlight gets turned to one corner of the room. And, you know, there's someone being healed. And then the other corner. And then the back. And it goes so loud over. And she's like, and I feel like they were just going around me. It's like, come on, God. It's like, right here is the people. with. If you see the wheelchairs, you know that we're in need. And this went on for about an hour and a half. And nothing happened. And then they started to get him out before everybody else to give him a chance to leave, you know, before the traffic formed. And she said that she was so disappointed and upset. She went home and she told God, what a bad joke, God, that you would take the people that needed the most and not do anything. Heal everybody around us and not do anything about me, about us. And then she said that she, that night as she was praying, mad at God, she came across, she just opened her Bible in the book of Mark and came across this passage where Jesus is healing people and he healed many of them. And then he, you know, all the way until, you know, sun was down and then they all went back to their homes and he got up really early in the morning and went out to pray. And the next morning, people that still needed healing came looking for him and no one could find him. And was, so his disciples go and find him and they bring him and say, Jesus, people are looking for you. And Jesus is like, I know, but you know, we need to go to the villages around to preach the message of the kingdom. Because that's why I've been sent. And Joni just recalls that he, she says, it was at this point that I realized that Jesus came to heal us all from a completely different sickness. And his focus was on taking care of this ultimate disease called sin. He came to heal us. Now, he may choose to heal some and may choose to not heal others. But he came to give his life so that we could all be healed from sin. And then he, she was reminded of Jesus himself, that she wasn't alone. That Jesus himself asked God, if this cup of suffering can pass from me, please let it be so. But not my will, but yours. And how he wasn't spared. And then in 2 Corinthians, we read that Paul, he had a thorn in his flesh. Some type of disease or sickness or pain or suffering that was, was in his life. And he has gotten not once or twice, but three times. And God just told them, I'm not going to do this for you. My grace needs to be sufficient for you. And then she was reminded of people in, in the New Testament, other Christians who were sick and, and suffering of different diseases like Trophimus and Timothy. How even though they were faithful servants, they were still sick and suffering from different illnesses. And then she got to Hebrews 4, 14 and 16. And I want to finish with this. Scripture. Because you and I need to keep hearing the same words of affirmation that says, say this, Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 say, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tested or tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Can God help you? Yes, he can. Can I guarantee you that it's his will to heal you or help you? I cannot. But I can tell you, you're not alone. And I can tell you, he cares about you. He's experienced it. He's been tested in every way. And so because of that, you can approach him with confidence. You can know that he is for you. That he loves you. And he's going to give you grace to help you in that time of need. And so we need to, as Christians, just hold firmly to that faith. Whether you have been in desperate moments, and now you're on the other side. Maybe you're going through that time of desperation. Or maybe you are not there yet. We need to commit to that faith that we want professed as Christians. And if you have not done so, I'm going to tell you, I don't know how you're going to face those desperate moments without Jesus. 
So I really encourage you to think about inviting him into your life today. This moment I'm going to pray and then we have some tassels right here. They may not look like the ones on the prayer shot, but we have a purpose for them and I'm going to tell you in just a minute. But first, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for what you do, for who you are. Lord, uh, I know there are people in this room that may be struggling right now, that we that may be asking, why, Lord, how long is this going to be in my life? Uh, maybe tired, uh, suffering, uh, any sort, Lord, emotionally or physically. Uh, also, I know that there are people that maybe have experienced it in the past and can attest to your faithfulness. And I know, Lord, there are people that maybe in neither of these situations, but Lord, I pray that this just sits in the back of their minds as a reminder when those moments come to stand strong. We want to be a faithful church to you. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.